Well, fight fans, this is another great career profile for you to listen to. One of the great heavyweights of the golden era, Mokin Joe Fraser. What a man. When we did the research for this, as you'll find through the course of the episode, there's a lot more to Smoking Joe's life and career than what meets the eye, than maybe what you even know about him. And that's what we love about these episodes of this series, is that we always find out something new about fighters. And this is going to be no different. You're going to find out probably something maybe you've not heard, and, and that's the beauty of why we do this. We love this. Smoking Joe Fraser, then, Johnston, is one of them influential men of the 1960s and 70s that has left this lasting legacy as one of the great heavyweights champions of all time. His name will always be synonymous with Muhammad Ali's and he's created his, his own fantastic legacy and what a man and what a heavyweight to be covering for our career profile series. An absolute legend, Joe Frazier. I mean, we've always known it, Joe Frazier. He slots in my top 10 best heavyweight boxers of all time, without a doubt. I mean, he, he probably go as high as number five for me you know he was that good he's a terrific fighter and, and and it's been great to be able to go through his early life some of the stuff uh, as you said some of the stories that we weren't we didn't know about so hopefully we, we can chuck in a few stories there that no one ever necessarily knew which is always great and just 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 his relationship with his father etc which we will go into and there's some funny stories in there and, and Joe was a lovely guy I mean, there's not really much I can say other than just going, you know, when we've done the research, he's, he's just a nice guy, as well as a fantastic fire in the ring. Absolutely. This is what the beauty of the series is all about, is learning things about fighters that maybe we didn't know, and maybe the people that listen, you guys, you didn't know all about as well. And even if you know about it, we just hope that you enjoy the tale of Joe Fraser and, and his life and his career. And it all begins for Billy Joe Fraser in the town of Beaufort, South Carolina, near the US Marine Base on Paris Island, which is a little sleepy town, clean but simple. He was born on January the 12th, 1944, one year before the end of World War II. And he was actually the youngest of 11, although some suggest 13 children in that family to Reuben and Dolly Fraser. Now, the whole family lived in a five-room shack on a 50-acre farm at Laurel Bay, on the Broad River. Reuben Fraser was a farmer and his family lived off the land. He didn't rent and he didn't share crop like most black families of that time. The Frasers owned their own place and Reuben Fraser worked it with his children. He grew peas, potatoes, corn, cabbage, okra and tomatoes and his children worked right alongside him from the moment they could walk. Now after tragically losing four children to starvation, worms, disease which would have been contracted by drinking contaminated water, and scurvy, which was a disease caused by a deficiency of vitamin C. Reuben Fraser had high hopes for his 13th child. He was quoted in the book, Come Out Smoking Joe Fraser, written by Phil Pep. There was something special coming on the mail train. This will be my famous son. Yeah, God, tragic in terms of uh, them losing... Their children. Maybe that's probably half the reason why there is a misconception as to exactly how many children they had. It's not easy to sort of find exactly how many. I mean, drinking contaminated water and 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 the lack of vitamin C deficiency. I mean, what a crazy way to lose children. Absolutely horrendous. Um, so the great thing about Ruben is is he he always felt that Joe was going to be his famous son, as you as you, as you put it there in the book, or, or Phil put that in the book. Smoking, at, uh, come out smoking, Joe Fraser, and it's a great book as well. I've got to say, we did use this as a as a great source as well as a couple of documentaries on YouTube, etc. So yeah, if you haven't read it, go and read it. Now, the year before Billy Joe was born, Reuben lost his arm in a shotgun accident, and basically, when Joe grew up and he became old enough. He became his dad's left-hand man, literally, quite literally his left-hand man. And they would actually run errands together and make moonshine in the woods. And and Joe remembers that he would hold a bolt with his right hand and I would screw the bolt. So literally, he was he was his left-hand man. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's crazy, but that's how they lived. They, was, they, they just couldn't be separated. They were together every day. And Joe would actually play baseball. He also loved to shoot marbles. But his mum wasn't 
keen on him taking to the water. Apparently, you know, there was a lake there, a river there, and she, she wasn't keen on him going swimming. I and mean, she said, I wouldn't let him go swimming. Too dangerous. I didn't want him playing around the river. Once I took him swimming in the ocean, but I kept an eye on him. He was playing baseball, you know, he's shooting marbles, nothing boxing related quite just yet. And when he was six, Billy Boy, as he was affectionately known, would work in the field pulling radishes, cutting broccoli and picking tomatoes and get paid $1 for a 12-hour day. That seems ludicrous given this day and age, but obviously that is the time that he lived in. A year later, he was driving his father's pickup truck. He would sit on Reuben's lap and be his other arm. Joe said, I grew up on my dad's arm. I went everywhere he went. We had a good time together. I learned some good, I learned some bad, but never nothing, Uncle. Joe and Reuben were very close, and they shared a love of cars, a love that Joe would take into his adult life. Dolly Fraser loved Joe just as much as Reuben, but she shared her love around their large family, and she said, I didn't give him no special treatment just because he was the baby. All of them were my children, and I treat them alike. His father paid him extra attention, but I never did, because I knew he was going to be leaving here sometime, going around, getting tough, and I didn't pet him. I kept them clean, and I stayed at home with him. And I don't care how large he is, when he come home, he must know that this is his mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dolly was... She shared her love, all right, but, you know, she ain't playing, mate, <laughs> by the sounds <laughs> of it. And, and Joe was a big boy as from a young age. and But Joe's sister... Julia, uh, she recalls some times when, when he was younger and she said that he was always the pride and joy of my father. He never wanted anybody to bother Joe or anything. And, and during the time he was growing up, he always used to say to us that Joe was going to be the second Joe Lewis. You know, his dad was a, a massive boxing fan. He used to listen to Joe Lewis on the radio and the whole family used to sort of sit around the box and listen to, to Joe's fights. And then in an interview while Joe was actually the world champion, his mother remembers him being about nine when he actually began his love affair with boxing. And it would have been from lis- listening to Joe Lewis on the radio, literally him going out and just sort of shadow boxing and trying to be like Joe Lewis. And, and this is what Dolly said. She said, no gloves. He fought with his naked hands. All the neighbourhood boys, he licked them all good. He was a good child. I just couldn't say he was bad. He never ran around and do much badness but children were children regardless when they go to play and do something you can't get them off what they're doing if they got their mind on it so now I thank God that he is the world champion fighter he is and obviously that was an interview that she had with one of the magazines when Joe was world champion just telling the story there that Joe was out there as a young lad big lad knocking out some young kids himself (laughs) <laughs> yeah, with no gloves and, and no rats or nothing on his hands. He was just going bare naked, fisted and just literally smashing these guys up when he was a kid. Wow. And those, I know I know it's it's a great story. And, and obviously that was conducted during the time he was the world champion. But going back to his early days, Joe took over an old wagon shed and he actually built his own gym. He filled a flour sack with sand and corn cobs and hung it from a tree. And that became Joe Frazier's punching bag. He would spend hours pounding that homemade bag every day, but everyone in the family, apart from his dad, never thought it would amount to anything. It was just an unimaginable and unreachable dream. Joe's sister, Rebecca, recalls these moments. When we called Joe to do the chores around the house, he would say, Oh, leave me alone. You know I'm going to box. You laugh at me if you want, but I'm going to be the next Joe Lewis. And Billy Joe Fraser believed every word like it was gospel. I guess I wanted to believe it. He didn't have no doubts, and neither did I. Yeah, his dad rubbing off on him there, basically telling Joe that he's going to be the next Joe Lewis, and he believed him. And and Joe's mum was actually the disciplinarian, and Ruben, you know, as I say, we keep mentioning, he he wasn't that sort of person to to, to discipline the children. It was it was the mum's role. Uh, that was the way they lived in their family, and she would make sure that all of her children stood by the Bible. Uh, she took them to church every Sunday but they would sing and pray. And basically Joe loved it. He loved going to the, going to the church and, and singing all the songs And on the documentary that's on YouTube. There's a couple on there, but there's one in particular where he does, he's like, starts busting into song. He loved to sing. And he would actually read a, a page from the Bible every night before bed, as all the other kids would. And his favorite 
was the book of Judges. And he said it's because it's about war and fighting puts me in the mind of war. Now, reading those pages from the Bible before bed actually became a ritual before every fight. So when he does move into fighting, which we'll go into, he said that when I go into the ring, I'm going to war. That's what a fight is. War. Everything I read, I try to relate to my book. I read the Bible all the time before a fight. I also like the 23rd Psalm and the book of Job because they talk about a man in need, a man with trouble. Fighting is trouble for me. If I miss and get hit, I've got to be ready for it. So, you know, from a young age, he took it into his adulthood. But reading those pages from the Bible influenced him as a fighter. Young Joe had a great determination to get himself out of poverty and make something of himself. A belief instilled in him by his father and the discipline, of course, by his mother. Joe had a clear picture in his mind of what he needed to do to succeed and how he would do it. He said, look, when you're on a farm, you sweat and you say to yourself, I'm getting out of here and maybe make a book. You've got to do that on your own and you work for it. These guys that wish for things and don't do nothing to get them, they make me sick. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> He's a, I tell you, the, the thing with Joe is that you can you can tell from an early age and in his own words from the quotations that he he had this belief because of his father, the discipline from his mother and the, the breeding of the Bible. He, he obviously believed that, you know, you've got to work so hard to get where you are. He, he wasn't naturally like a talented person in general he worked so hard for it as we'll cover through the course of the episode but it's quotes like this that that really hit home for me when you hear him talking about i can hear him saying these words as i'm reading them out and reading the quotes and you just think to myself you know it just gives me more of an affection for the guy now joe actually went and tried other sports he tried baseball and american football but it just wasn't his bag football especially annoyed him saying what i didn't like is when you're down Ten people can jump on you. And Joe attended the Robert Small High School, but was eventually expelled at 14 for, would you guess, fighting. (laughs) It was at this young age that Joe was racially abused. And in his words, he said, Until then, I guess I thought everybody was black because I didn't know any better. One night, this white cat called me the N-word. It was the first time I'd heard the word and I hated it right from the off. Hey, N-word. What you doing? He gets in his car and damn near runs me off the road. Then he gets out and grabs me. He's bigger than me and he gets me down real quick. But I start hitting him back and every time I hit him I draw blood. I have him down in the dirt and the blood's all over his face and one of my balls yells, Finish him off Joe, finish him off. He's begging at this point. Hey man, we can talk this thing over, can't we? I let him go. I never had any more trouble from him after that <laughs> brilliant absolutely brilliant deserve to get put right in his place and uh and just, just again i mean just hearing from from his own words there that you know he'd, he'd never heard the n-word living in in, in an all-black neighborhood just didn't hear it i mean within his family as well so interesting um gets expelled from school 14 as well but it was i mean you know he's, he's working at a very young age what one dollar for 12 hour shifts it's insane absolutely insane and so, so following school, Joe obviously got a job and he got a job in construction for a decent wage back then for one dollar and seventy five cents an hour. So it's a lot more than the 12 hours for one dollar. The hard physical labor actually helped Joe build up his strength and the money was going to pay for his trip north. Something he always dreamed about and obviously getting out of the area that he currently lived in. And during this time, he met his first love, who was Florence Smith at her uncle's funeral and she said in her words that joe came in with his family to pay their respects and the first time i looked at him i said wow that's the man for me and and they they married on september 25th 1959 when joe was actually 15 wow um i think he was a i think he was like a couple of weeks shy of his 16th birthday and a, a year later they had a son and their son's name was mavis uh, mavis frazier I'm sure many of us will, will recall who Mavis was. So, yeah, very young, becoming a an adult quite quickly. Yeah, really quickly. Bloody yeah, hell, 15, getting married, and then a year later, 16, and he's got a kid. Wow, it's just, I can't even imagine having a child at 16 years of age and being in that sort of, 
poverty stricken life and, and having to literally fight for every dollar that you earn and yeah if again the respect has to has to grow doesn't it the more you talk about it the more you go through his career the more you go through his life you start to certainly get that feeling that he needs more respect than, than what he ever ever got from a lot of the boxing fans now in search of a better life for his young family joe moved to new york with his brother tom and he said i left the south as soon as i found out about the north I've always been on the move anyway. You know, man, you've got to keep moving. You don't get nowhere standing still. You don't do that. They're going to pass you by. Joe was clearly determined to make a better life for himself. And he said, when I decided to leave, I just packed up and left. What I mean there was no hugging and kissing. I just caught the first thing smoking north and I left. Yeah, life was like, you know, uh, uh, different water, different bathroom. <laughs> Money was bad. And it's then uh, we lived in, let's say, uh, a house that keep the sun and the rain off us at, at night or day. That's what it was. And uh, let's say animosity, bigotry, hatred, prejudice, white water, color water, doesn't matter. At the time that uh, I was just a little boy and I didn't quite know what really going on. We, one thing I can remember way back, uh, Wednesday night fight. It was like, uh, let's say way back, uh, guys like, uh, let's say, Dempsey, uh, Joe Lewis, back in those days, uh, Robinson, uh, Rocky Marciano, all of, uh, Jack Dempsey, all those guys, you know, I could remember, uh, by seeing them up here, I used to watch them when I was a little boy. And like, uh, on Wednesday night, uh, fight, uh, dad and all the uncles and the bigger guys in the community watch Wednesday night fight. And uh, I would probably be sitting down, uh, hiding in the back, but I run through, I would say, excuse me, run through. And then uh, the uncle say, hot dash, that's it. That boy over there going to be another Joe Lewis. Look at, look at the body on that boy. That boy going to be a champion. Well, so a year later, Joe moved to Philadelphia. So from New York, New York to Philadelphia to live with his aunt. And he uh, took up a job at a butcher's for $105 a week, which is, that is an exceptional amount. A lot more money than what he was currently earning. So, hence why you can see why he went north. And Joe basically wasn't fussed what job he got. The main thing was money. He needed to support his family. Now, Joe remembers this time at the Cross Bros Meat Packers Company. And he said the slaughterhouse was nothing to write home to Mama about. But it was a job. It was something I could do. It didn't make no difference. Now, he would also used slabs of meat to practice his jabs. A, a future trainer of his, who was Val Corbett, actually said that he was the original Rocky. I think they said pounding the meat and running up those museum steps. I wonder if Rocky might have got inspiration from this, for, from the smoking Joe. Who knows? So now earning a decent wage, obviously, Joe managed to get himself an apartment. And the first thing he did was call Florence and tell her to get a ticket north with their young son, Mavis. At 18, Fraser walked in to the 23rd Police Athletic League, also known as PAL, and it was the gym on 22nd and Columbia in Philadelphia. He went there initially to lose weight, and he recalls, my legs were so fat that I couldn't even get my pants on. <laughs> his family were all happy that he chose to pursue his dream. His sister, Martha, said, I was very, very happy that he chose boxing, because if he didn't, I don't know where he would have gone. Boxing instructor... Duke Jugent remembers the day Joe arrived in his gym in great detail, he says. It was late afternoon in 1962. He was wearing a suit and coat and trousers that didn't match. A shirt, but no tie. He said he wanted to learn boxing to see if he could make a living at it. I had him fill out a membership form. He said he didn't have any gym clothes, but I told him not to worry, we'd find him some. It wasn't easy. He was big, weighed about £240, and we had trouble finding something that would fit. 240 pounds at that 18. He was definitely a big boy, wasn't he? Joe would run the streets from 4am and then go straight to work for a hard eight-hour graft before heading to the gym at 9pm for a training session. Now, after a week or so, Dugan asked Yance, Yank Durham, a local professional trainer, to take a look at Fraser. And Durham remembers, I watched him a while and one thing impressed me right off. The boy could punch. At first, I thought he was just another fat kid who would quit after a few days, but he didn't. He kept coming back. I wasn't involved with him then. I had my own fighters to worry about, but I noticed him. You couldn't help it. 
he would show up in that gym with all his hands cut up and tired from working in the slaughterhouse all day. Other guys would stop coming around, but not Joe. He kept coming back, and that made you know he was something special. That's impressive. Clearly, just he's ready to get his head down and go for it, and he's found boxing. He always, you know, he ins- his dad, his father inspired him when he's been next Joe Lewis, and he, you know, running at four in the morning, doing an eight-hour shift, and then going to the gym after. I mean, uh, that that's a hard graft. I suppose at six years old, working the the farmland for 12 hours for only a dollar i suppose that that gets you in a good frame of mind that's probably easy work for him now the fat kid that couldn't fit into his trousers and showed up at the pal gym one afternoon in 1962 was actually so devoted to becoming the second joe lewis as his dad always hoped that he trained like a machine it wasn't long before he had shed all that fat and turned it into pure muscle it wasn't until he was introduced to the heavy bag that Dugent noticed he also had tremendous power. And he recalled that he would wallop it. I mean, really whacked it with short power. Dugent was so impressed that he decided to focus more on Joe's short range assaults and taught him how to double and triple up that left hook. Dugent recollects the first moments in the gym when he obviously tried to adapt this style, and he said, at first he was bad. The next day he was great. Just like that. He learned quickly. He mastered the punching combinations in no time. He had more fortitude than any man I'd ever known. Not that I thought for one minute in those days that he would become a world champion. How could you? But as hard as he was working, as quickly as he was learning, I knew he'd be something special. And there are some great words straight away from from Juge and so obviously talking about what they saw in him at that early stage. Now, not only was Joe improving rapidly, but he also had a love for the gym. And he said, I thought it was thrilling. I felt like I had more energy than the average guy. He clearly still had enough energy after those long shifts in the day and training at the gym at night, as he and Florence actually knocked up another two kids by the end of 1962. Now, they had a daughter named Jackie and a second son named Joe Jr. Now, Dugent decided it was time to send Joe Sr. into amateur boxing and send him up and down the country. It didn't take long for Joe to make an impact. He won the Middle Atlantic Golden Gloves Heavyweight Championship in 1963 and again in 1964. His only defeat in three years was a decision to a 300-pounder from Michigan named Buster Mathis. Next up for Joe was the Olympic Trials, which were held in the Singer Bowl at the site of the World's Fair in Flushing Meadow, New York. Dugent was struck down with a virus, so he could not be in Joe's corner. Coincidentally, the Amateur Athletic Union requested that Yank Durham step in as the replacement. Now, After six wins, all by knockout, Joe met Buster Mathis in the final, a winner-takes-all fight and the chance to represent the USA at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. So, Mathis was the press favourite due to his size and how he was surprisingly agile for such a big guy at 300 pounds. And it was a close fight, by all accounts, but many felt that Fraser deserved the nod. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be, and Mathis was actually given a points victory and a place on the plane. Now, Dugent remembered, and he said... He thought he won the fight and deserved to be the one to represent his country in Tokyo. A lot of people thought Joe won too. Buster wore his trunks almost up to his chin and Joe had hardly any target at all. If he tried to punch the body, he was warned to keep his punches above the belt. But Buster's belt was somewhere around his chest. Now Fraser was actually ruthless in the amateur boxing circuit, knocking out opponent after opponent. But his second loss to Mathis meant his Olympic dream was over, which made him consider quitting the sport altogether. Now, fortunately, Durham and Dugent actually convinced him to continue on with the sport and be a standby and a sparring partner for Buster Mathis. Now, initially, Joe refused because he didn't want to lose his job at the butchers. So Dugent actually called the Philadelphia police commissioner, who was Frank Rizzo, who contacted his employers and they agreed to hold the job for him while he was obviously in in Tokyo. So the United States Olympic Committee then certified Joe to travel with the team, and it was Bon Voyage Philly and Hello Tokyo. And he went as a sparring partner and as a standby. Now, just before the US team travelled to Tokyo, 
They held an exhibition in San Francisco for the troops at the Hamilton Air Force Base. Fraser was paired with Mathis, who threw a right hand that landed with a crack on Joe's head. Mathis had broken a finger on Fraser's head, and it would have to be in a cast until October the 10th. The Olympics were scheduled to start on October the 11th, so that meant he was out. And of course, Joe Fraser steps in as the substitute. And in Joe's words, he said, They had no choice. There was only one heavyweight left, and it was me. Either I fought, or they forfeited any chance of picking up a medal in my division. I thought that everybody's eyes were on me. At the time, in Philadelphia, the Phillies weren't doing so well, and I got letters from my wife and sisters, you know, saying, hey, don't let us down like the Phillies. This kind of gave me the confidence to keep going. And this was the first fight. So he fought a guy called George Owello of Uganda, and, and he basically dealt with him, uh, knocked him out in the first round. Then in the second fight, he knocked out a guy called Athol McQueen of Australia in the third round, which then put him into the semi-finals, where he came up against a huge Russian called Vadim Yamelyanov. So all the other Americans had been dumped out of the Olympics, but seven Russians remained. So it became a bit of a political fight in the semi-final for the nation, as well as a crucial moment, obviously, in Joe Frazier's boxing career. Now, his left hooks were short, hard and painful as he knocked the Russian down twice in the second. Joe recalls my left hook was a heat-seeking missile, canaring off his face and body time and again. While in complete control of the fight, his chances of Olympic glory were actually thrown into complete jeopardy. Joe said, as I pounded away, I felt a jolt of pain shoot through my left arm. Oh, damn, the thumb. Joe had broken his thumb. But thankfully, a white towel landed in the ring, signalling the end of the fight and basically saving Joe and his thumb for the final. Wow, that's a great story. (laughs) Well, that's absolutely crazy, that. that, How did he he get away with that? Now, Joe Fraser could become the first American to win the Olympic heavyweight championship if he could overcome the massive German Hans Huber. Floyd Patterson, who was a middleweight, and Cassius Clay at light heavyweight had gone on to become world heavyweight champions after winning the Olympic gold, but neither had won it at heavyweight. Fraser was still in considerable pain, but avoided an x-ray saying it wasn't that bad. He didn't want to forfeit like Mathis did and opted to fight on. Joe explained in his own words, I'd gone all that way. I couldn't let one hand pull me back. I simply had to come on with the title. Too many people were counting on me. I couldn't let them down. If I didn't take that medal, I made my mind up. I'd go back to the butcher shop and forget about professional fighting. Now, Joe, of course, showed his true grit and determination to fight on in the Olympic final with a broken thumb, limiting his dangerous left hook and throwing more right hands than usual to win a very close points decision with three of the five judges giving him the nod. Of course, then Joe returns to the United States with that gold medal around his neck and a cast on his left hand. Nothing going to replace the games because the games was at all, let's say, countries and let's say different guys all together that really didn't know how to fight but did not throw punches. See, a lot of, a lot of guys get out there and uh, they, they call themselves fighting but then they can't throw punches. Uh, I was like a deadly guy, you know what I mean? I was a marksman, you know. <laughs> what I aim at, that's what I hit. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> great. I mean, fantastic. And, and just, just you mentioning there, Joe Frazier being the first heavyweight to ever win Olympic gold. I, as I said to you at the top, before we even started recording this, that gazumped me. I, I, honestly, I, for some, for, in my head, I just thought it was Ali, but obviously he was light heavyweight. So a great quiz question there. Fantastic achievement from Joe. Obviously, saddened by the fact that he's cast his hands in a cast but he did end his amateur career he ended his amateur career with a record of 38 and 2 but by some records they actually indicate that he was 57 and 2 so i'm not quite sure that there's a massive difference there someone said he had 59 fights others say that it was only 41 maybe just some of these fights weren't weren't picked up so it's a bit confusing but those two defeats to buster mathis seem to be 100 percent correct because that's the one thing you are getting, and God knows how many knocked out. I think he literally knocked them all out, apart from Buster, Buster, to be honest with you. But one thing we didn't allude to, which was at the start of the Olympic dream, 
sadly for Joe, he actually lost Ruben Fraser, his father. He actually died in 1965 before he could witness his famous son turn professional and before he could see Joe become the second Joe Lewis, as he always dreamed of. So there just wasn't nothing there from Joe in terms of for his father, what he, what he said about him. So yeah, I'm sure he was sad and probably something you just can't talk about. Yeah, it must have been really difficult for him, really, because obviously he said at the start of, of, of telling this story, he, he was so close and his dad... He was like the golden child, weren't he, out of all the children he had, and, and he wanted to see his son go on to, to do so well. So for him to not see him go on to have some of a professional career, it is sad because of the relationship that they had. Although his Olympic glory should have been the start of several professional contract offers, he wasn't able to box due to the injury for the best part of a year, and he couldn't work in the butchers either. Now, Larry Merchant of HBO Boxing spoke of Joe as a personality during this point, saying... He was an afterthought, even going to the Olympics and coming back from the Olympics. With Christmas around the corner, a Philadelphia sports writer began to raise money for the Fraser family to save their Christmas. Soon enough, money, job offers and even a call from the mayor began to come through. He even received $100 from his butchers and Joe used the money to buy gifts for his wife and kids. And he said, it wasn't very much, but I wanted to let the kids know that daddy was still around. And that must have been a really tough time for the Frasers at that time. Coming back from the Olympics, obviously with the bus stand not being able to work, not being able to earn money, not being able to box. But it's really good to see that, that Philly was behind him. They really were. And there was some, there was, there's more in-depth detail in that in terms of the radio stations where the, the guy that initially started to raise the money and then more came in and I think the mayor called him as well. Everyone got behind him kind of thing. But obviously being out of the ring, it wasn't nice for Joe. It was good they saved their Christmas. It's a strange one because of his Tokyo, the Olympics was in October. I think that's where we were just assuming it was the summer. Oh, I'll do anyway. So Joe did finally get through a turbulent year and he turned professional in the spring of 1965. Now, Duke Dugent, who would actually no longer be Joe's lead trainer, and uh, this was because the police department rule that officers could not manage professional fighters. So he decided to stay amateur and just stay with the gym and, and train the amateur kids. So young Darren officially took over as the head coach and he brought in a guy called Willie Reddish. And he had fought a professional as a heavyweight and actually trained Sonny Liston for his two fights with Cassius Clay. Now, Thomas Frazier saw the relationship between his brother, Joe, and and Yank Durham from the outside. And he said, Joe learned to respect Yank early on. And Yank learned to respect Joe for what he was early on. It was more like a father and son team, which would have been great for Joe after losing his father. And his professional debut was a four-rounder in Philadelphia's Convention Center on August 16, 1965. Joe was paid $500 to fight a guy called Don Hobson. But he pulled out and his replacement was named Roy Johnson. And on the night of the fight, Joe's opponent changed once again. In the other corner was Elwood Goss, the Rose. He was a steam fitter who was pulled out of his seat when they asked Goss if he would be willing to fight Joe Fraser. He said, sure, who knows, I might get lucky. Elwood Goss got lucky, all right. He was lucky to come out alive that fight. Fraser hit him with a left hook in the first round and the Rose went down. Referee Zach Clayton decided he'd seen enough and stopped the fight after 1 minute and 42 seconds of the first round. Zach Clayton was quoted as saying, If they want a fight, let them get somebody who can fight. This guy can't fight at all. One punch will kill him. <laughs> I'll make him right. I mean, <laughs> pull him off his seat, gets a bit of money and gets knocked out by Joe Frazier. I mean, is he nuts? Jesus Christ, you couldn't have paid me to get in that ring. Oh, my days. Geezer's got balls, man. But coincidentally as well, which was quite ironic, was Buster Mathis was making his professional debut in New York on the same night. And crazily, actually received more publicity than Frazier, even though obviously Frazier was the Olympic gold champion. And, and, and you'd, you'd assume that Frazier would be where all the publicity would be. But no, and... So attentions obviously turned almost immediately to a potential showdown between the two rivals straight after Joe's knockout win. He was actually asked about it and Joe said, he got two decisions over me, but he didn't beat me. I don't consider I got beat when I lost by one point and he had his trunks up to his chest. <laughs> Talk of Frazier and Mathers fight was, well, it had begun already and it wasn't going to happen until 1968. Now managerial offers began to intensify and all Joe said 
he wanted was $25,000 placed in a trust and a salary of $150 a week. But Yank held out. And we'll go into why Yank held out. And very clever man, Yank Darren. Well, it's crazy that he's not even asking for more. And he's just literally saying, $25,000, stick it in the trust fund, obviously <laughs> for his kids, and I'll just take $150 a week. He wasn't even asking for a lot. There was no demand from him really there. Now, the jury was still out on Fraser, with many boxing experts not convinced that his small frame, short reach, and one-dimensional style could actually make a dent on any of the top heavyweights. Yank Durham had to keep Fraser grounded, and he knew there was still a lot of work to be done in the gym to master the technique he believed would make him a success. Yank told Joe, with your power, you can do your thing only one way. That's to keep within hand distance of your opponent all the time. You don't do it no other way. In forward, forward, punch, punch, punch all the time. No one will stand up to you. No one. Thomas Fraser said that his brother's style was the reason for his nickname, Smoke. He never stopped, you know, like a locomotive train. That's why they called him Smoke. Wow, never knew that as well. I always thought, why smoking, Joe? I always thought it was because he said, I come out smoking. But yeah, like a mo- locomotive train, he was relentless, wasn't he? A great nickname. And just over a month later, and Joe was back in the ring against a guy called Mike Bruce. And this was the first fight that Yank realised that he had more than just a powerful puncher and he had a fight with heart because bruce landed one on his chin and joe basically buckled onto the canvas it looked like he was gonna get knocked out i mean it was crazy but he did get back up to knock bruce out in the third eight days later fraser wiped out ray staples in two and 13 days after he finished off a davis in one four knockouts in four professional fights but 1965 to an end, and it was a great start. Apart from that little slip up against Bruce, a good start for Joe. Now, Yank Durham was ready to listen to offers from wealthy businessmen as he implemented a plan to create a syndicate similar to the one Muhammad Ali had established. It was called Cloverleaf Incorporated, the name coming from a wedding of words Cloverleaf for luck, overlay from a betting term that means good odds. Through the church, Yank met Dr. F. Bruce Baldwin the former president of a dairy and current president of a well-known baking company. Baldwin sought out bankers, industrialists, contractors, lawyers, clergymen, doctors and journalists, and soon he had a group of 40 interested parties in Joe Fraser. So Joe Fraser now signs a three-year contract with the syndicate, holding options for two additional three-year periods. Under the original agreement, Fraser would receive a salary of $100 a week. Later, it was increased to $173 a week, then to $1,000 per week. He also got 50% of his ring earnings, half to be paid in cash in deferred compensations, the other half to be invested. The stockholders got 35% out of what they paid, all expenses, and the other 15% went to Yank Durham serving in the capacity of manager slash trainer slash advisor and basically calling all the shots without the Cloverlay interference. Beautiful. I mean, Fraser was even said himself that he was looking at sort of promoters, any promoter, you know, what he wanted that $25,000. In the end, Yank Durham obviously looked at the blueprint from Hamid Ali, created Cloverlay. Brilliant. And all these guys as well, they're all from, obviously, they're all wealthy. They just had love for the, for boxing. It, they didn't want anything really in return. All they wanted was a picture of Joe Frazier when he becomes world champion and to go to the fights for nothing and sit ringside. That was all they asked for. So it was a great bit of business there that Yank put together for Joe and, and, and it stayed together literally throughout his career. It's, it's a great move. Now, with the business side of things completed and Joe now set for a future in and out of the ring, it was time to put the graft in the gym. And from January to July 1966, Joe fought seven times, winning all by knockout or stoppage and bringing his professional record to 11-0. Now, Durham also gave him exposure in New York and Los Angeles in those fights, but obviously a majority of those fights were fought in Philadelphia. Now, in Joe's 12th professional fight, Yank Durham was approached by Madison Square Garden and offered him a fight, handing over a a list of possible opponents. So, Darren looked at the opponents and he chose 23-year-old Argentinian Oscar Bonavino, who was 21-2. and two. 
Now, his only defeats actually came to Azura Foley, who was a fantastic fighter, and Jose Giragretti. But he actually avenged that second loss before outpointing George Tavalo in his last fight. Now, you know, we all know Oscar Bonavina now. You know, he was a, he was a guy that he probably one of the best fighters that never picked up a world title in this era. So Durham felt that Bonavina would be Joe's hardest test and a step up in levels. So he informed Madison Square Garden matchmaker, who was Teddy Brenner, of his decision that he wants Oscar and the contract was signed. Frazier was to top the bill for the first time in his career on September 21st, 1966, at the age of 22 years old and a 10-rounder against another left hooker, Oscar Bonavina. Now, after winning the first round comfortably, disaster struck in the second when Bonavina landed a short, sharp right hand that put Joe down to the canvas. He got back to his feet but was still clearly dazed and inevitably walked onto a thudding left which put him down for a second time. Now, after a standing eight count, Fraser managed to continue on rubbery legs with still half the round to go. Fraser was one knockdown away from defeat as the New York State rules at the time indicated that if a man is knocked down three times in a single round, the fight was automatically stopped. Now Bonavina tried everything he could to find the winning blow but smothered his own work and got cut in the process. Now this allowed Joe to recover, hold on and clear his head. Durham used his 60 seconds well using every trick in the book to liven up the drowsy Fraser before sending him out for the third. Joe was clever. He kept his distance at first, then pushed Bonavina back to the ropes and held when he needed to. By the fourth, his head was clear and it was all Fraser who dominated and beat up the Argentinian for the next six rounds to get a majority decision. There were no arguments from the crowd and Joe had just completed his first 10 rounder and showed great heart, but it was a learning fight that almost went wrong. Now, while Joe was the perfect student in many ways, he did sometimes get ahead of himself and believed he was ready for the likes of Arley, Liston and even Floyd Patterson, when he clearly wasn't. So Yank Durham asked him after the fight, now, are you ready to listen? Great story there. Well, I mean, he was very lucky there. The free free knockdown rule would have, I mean, if anything, if he'd have pushed him over and the referee had found that as, as a knockdown, that would have been the end of it. For Joe, and they had all these, uh, the Cloverlay, the uh, Syndicate, they're all there as well. They all brought their buddies for the big night at Madison Square Garden. It was going to end in disaster for, for Joe. And, but he showed great courage to come back, as he did in the Olympic final when he when he had a broken thumb. But Fraser was ready after what Yank gave him a dressing down. And he was ready. He got his first reality check. And Durham knew Joe's strengths. But he also knew his weaknesses. So they implemented a style. And obviously the style, the Joe Frazier style, is now that infamous style. And Yank Durham told Joe, he said to him, your legs are too big for you to move around a lot. Your arms are too short for you to be a jabbing boxer. You don't have the height to give you leverage. You're out there trying to jab, move and be a boxer. You don't have the build for it. You'll wear yourself out. You've got to bring your arms in close and put your legs together and go in there punching. You can't pick off punches. You've got to move your head, bob and weave, slip punches and keep coming. Yank would be asked why he didn't teach Joe to box more when he was in the gym. You know, those around used to say, well, why don't you teach him how to box? And he used to say, it takes a boxer 10 rounds to do what Joe gets done in two or three. Joe destroys a man with power. When Joe gets through with a man, he's all busted up. His offense is his defense and his defense is fighting. And, well, what great advice from Yank Darrell. It just goes to show you the quotes and, and the way he's described to Joe Fraser how he should fight is, well, it's it's not even infamous. It's famous now, isn't it? When you think about it, it's famous. The Joe Fraser style is very famous. A lot of fighters look to Joe Fraser's style. Smaller fighters, more stockier fighters, they look at the Joe Fraser style and they think this is the way to get on the inside of a much taller fighter and, and land them shots. So this is what Yank Durham created and he implemented that into Joe Fraser's game plan. Exactly two months later, November the 21st in Los Angeles, Durham chose a veteran opponent in Eddie Machen who was 58-3. and three. Many Philadelphia sports writers criticising Joe's next opponent as they felt Joe was being rushed. And some at Cloverley were a little surprised, but Durham knew exactly what he was doing. He even had a report on Mason from Eddie Futch that read, 
From what you've told me about Fraser, the kind of fighter he is, the style he has, he can take Mation. He is still good. He's tough and he's cagey, but he's older and he's slowed a little. His style is tailor-made for Joe. He's easy to hit. I'm certain Joe will get to him with hooks. Slow him up and win the fight. Futch predicted that fight pretty much on the money. Mation took the first few, but then Fraser took over from there. And once he got Mation on the ropes in the 10th, referee Tommy Hart stopped the fight. Fraser was in bullish mood after this performance and he said, My first fight with an old pro, I had to keep driving all the way before I finally got to him. Now, what do those Philadelphia sports writers think of me? Do they still think I'm being rushed? Do they still think I'm not ready for fighters like Eddie Mason? I'm ready for anybody. Mason actually praised Fraser after the fight by saying, He needs polishing, but he's awful good. The boy has no defence, but... The way he stays on top of you, he doesn't need one. Oh, great. Uh, fantastic performance there. And, and the fact that, you know, people were, were knocking Yank. And, and it obviously, Joe's looked at what Yank's provided for him with Cloverlay. And, and now, you know, if he's picking opponents, he knows. he knows You know, he's got through the Oscar fight now. And, and this is the next big thing for him. And then he, he produces the goods. And again, that left hook was just devastating. And I believe it, even Eddie was saying, because he had actually fought uh, Rocky Marciano, he actually said that he hit just as hard as he did. He's going to know. He's been, he shared the ring with a pair of them. Sports writers did now begin to take Joe seriously as a top heavyweight, considering his size, but that they knew he was going to be a heavyweight contender. And he kicked off February 1967, by making history and his it was his fight against a guy called Doug Jones that drew a crowd of 7,203 and generated a gate of 46,432. Now both were actually records in the 47 year history of the Convention Hall Arena in Philadelphia. Now he stopped Jones in six and then two months later Jefferson Davis in five and then went a 10 round distance with George Johnson winning an easy points decision. But obviously, George had that. He could say he went the distance with him as well. So he was quite happy with himself, I'm sure, just getting through that fight. Now, that same month, on April 28th, 1967, Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. He was stripped of his world titles, the WBA, WBC, and the MYSAC, and his boxing license was suspended. Although, you know, how devastating that was for us, you know, we weren't obviously living at the time. It would have been for for, for, for Muhammad Ali fans. It half opened the door for someone like Joe Frazier. Now, Frazier continued his fighting in the ring. And two months later, on July the 19th, Joe was once again top of the bill at MSG against a guy who had never been stopped, not even by Muhammad Ali, over a year earlier. And that was the Canadian, George Shavala, who was 47, 13 and 2. Joe was keen to make sure he impressed the MSG crowd this time around, and he did. He became the first man to stop the tough Chavalo by beating his ass for four rounds until the referee saw enough and he stopped it. To finish the year, Joe picked up two knockout victories. Firstly, over Tony Doyle in two rounds at the redeveloped Philadelphia Spectrum. And Joe spoke in his dressing room afterwards and said, I'm the first ever to fight here in the Spectrum. And some night, I'll come back here to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. Joe then stopped Marion Connor in three rounds at the Boston Garden to go 19-0 with 17 KOs at just only 23 years old. Well, still a baby. And and uh, obviously with, with Ali now suspended, the, the WBA decided to select the eight leading heavyweights based on its monthly rankings to crown a new heavyweight champion in Ali's absence. They were Floyd Patterson, Jimmy Ellis, Fad Spencer, Oscar Bonavina, Ernie Terrell, Carl Mildenberger, Jerry Quarry, and Joe Frazier. Now, it all sounded good. It was a guaranteed $25,000 for the first fight, $50,000 for the second, and $100,000 for the last. A total of $175,000 for three fights, which was more money than Joe earned in his entire 19 professional fights he'd already had. Now, obviously, Yank Durham, once again, he intervenes. Savvy old sod he was, and and he actually decided he wasn't interested. He didn't want to. He, he didn't want any part of it. He wanted to take a gamble. He decided he's going to take a gamble. He's going to pull Joe out of this tournament, and he said, "Screw this tournament. I don't need them. They need me." 
let them fight it out and I'll fight the winner. Now, that is literally how Yank used to uh, actually always speak in the first person. So when he was spoke about someone, he would it almost like he was one person. So when he said that, he's speaking on behalf of Joe Frazier. It was just weird how he does it. But sometimes some of these quotes, you might pick up on that, that when he says I, he does mean him and Joe together. The common theme in his style that he used. And Frazier, at this point, was actually now ranked as the number one contender. So he would get shot inevitably anyway. Now, once the winner was crowned, he would be the first point of call. And that was basically Durham's theory. And the argument that he put to the Cloverlay Board of Directors on May 10th, 1967, he outlined his reasons for holding out and obviously not getting Joe to participate in this tournament. And he convinced the board and they voted unanimously to with Yank. And the group told the press of their decision. And they said the money isn't enough. That was what they said. And we won't fight in this tournament but we'll fight anyone, anytime. So it's it was a gamble. It was a big risk. And, well, you'll find out if it was the right risk or not. Well, Yank knew exactly what he was doing. With the WBA number one contender not being in their big marquee tournament, it made them look bad for not offering more money. But they did have seven other decent contenders. One of the names missing from that list was Joe's amateur nemesis, an undefeated professional, Buster Mathis, who's now 23-0. A fight Yank knew would bring the public attention due to their rivalry, of course, in the amateurs. Emil Griffith and Nino Benaviti fought for the middleweight title as the co-main event, and this was the first fight at MSG since its revamp, its fourth renovation since 1882. To add even more spice to the fight, the New York State Athletic Commission decided to sanction the fight as a title bout. The winner would be recognised in New York as a heavyweight champion of the world and hold a portion of the title in just one fight. Now to rub more salt in the wounds of the WBA, Fraser actually earned $175,000, the same amount on offer if Fraser made it to the final of the tournament. All that was left to do now for Joe was to win. <laughs> Beautiful. He must have seen that list, Yank Darrow, and he must have seen that Buster wasn't on it. And it was a fight they spoke about from his first professional fight. He must have thought, why haven't they got Buster on there? In his head, I'm sure that's what he thought. You know, he was he, he knew MSG. He, he knew if he was to offer him something, a fight like that. And then to have Emil Griffith and Benavidez on the on the bill as a middleweight title fight. And then you get the New York State Athletic Commission then just sanctioning the title for him. I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, and, and to get $175,000. Ah, it's just it's just genius. It really is. Again, once again, Yank Durham just coming through and. Now, it was the fight itself, it was an even battle for six rounds, but Frazier took control and we'll, we'll let the Associated Press round off the action in the 11th. And it said, Joe Frazier connected with a short, thunderous left hook in the closing minute of the 11th round to stop king-size Buster Mathis. The punch sent the bloody giant on his back over the bottom strand of the rope. There's a great picture of Buster Mathis as well. Literally, his head's sort of pillowed on that bottom rope and Mathis barely staggered to his feet at nine, but referee Arthur McCante immediately halted the fight. Frazier's mighty blow brought a huge roar from the near-capacity crowd in the 20,000-seat arena. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. There was a divide as to whether Fraser could be considered a world champion. He was actually only recognised in six states across America, and even in the UK, the British Boxing Board of Control, they didn't even look at him as their world champion. They actually considered Muhammad Ali as the real champion. The WBA had finally got theirs. Two months after Joe's win, Jimmy Ellis defeated Jerry Quarry in California. Ideally, Ellis and Fraser should have fought to merge the two versions of the titles, but it never happened, mainly due to Angelo Dundee, who followed the same blueprint as Custy Amato when he refused to put Patterson in the ring with Liston the decade before. He was not willing to put Ellis in the ring with Fraser because he quite simply knew it would be like sending a lamb to the slaughter. So he stalled for two years before his hand was forced. Ironically, Ellis only defended his title once against Patterson in a highly disputed decision. Yeah, strange one. It took ages, whereas Fraser on the other hand, he was active. Just four months after he won the version or a version of the title, Fraser knocked out a Mexican champion. Manuel Ramos in two rounds on June 24th, 1968 at the Garden. Again, six months later, Joe Handley beat Oscar Bonavina, this time in their rematch, which was a 15-round pasting in Philadelphia. Then on April 22nd, 1969 in Houston, Texas, Frazier recorded the second fastest knockout in heavyweight championship fight 
when he disposed of Dave Zigglewich in 96 seconds. Joe took some stick for that fight, basically because he just <laughs> bowled him over, but um, he won over the public and the sports writers when he returned to Madison Square Garden on June 23, 1969, against a guy called Jerry Quarry, who had actually lost in the final to Ellis, 31-2-4. Now, this fight was actually stopped in the seventh before Quarry's face was terribly swollen, but for four rounds, it was one of those great fights, Sean. And I'll use that expression that old saying you love to throw out. It was a fight in a phone booth. There was no defense. Both guys literally smashed lumps at each other until Frazier come out on top. It was actually named the fight of the year by the Ring magazine and definitely, definitely, definitely worth a watch. It's an absolute classic. If you haven't seen it, please go and just check up YouTube. Put in uh, Frazier Quarry 1, not 2, but 1, the first time they fight. And literally four rounds, they smashed the crap out of each other. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Also on the card, George Foreman actually made his professional debut. Well, there you go. There's another bit of news on there as well. Now, (laughs) while Joe was being interviewed after his win over Quarry, Jimmy Ellis, 27 and 5, who sat ringside, shouted, when are you going to fight a real man? And Fraser replied, whenever you're ready. They were both ready on February the 16th, 1970, at Madison Square Garden. And it was billed Battle of the Champions. The WBC were finally ready to recognise a fight between the New York State Athletic Commission champion Joe Frazier and Jimmy Ellis, the WBA champion, and decided to put their world title on the line. It was probably the perfect preparations for a future fight with Ali, who would make his inevitable return. Ellis was no Ali, though, but he had a similar style. Joe wasn't going to change his style, as he frequently said, I just come out smoking. And he promised to come out smoking against Ellis. The fight ended as expected and Joe became the 21st lineal heavyweight champion making light work of Ellis. The fight was stopped when Dundee refused to let Ellis out for the 5th round following 2 knockdowns in the 4th. And it was the right decision. The post-fight press conference confirmed that when a reporter asked, Jimmy, did you think you'd get up after the second knockdown? How many times did I go down? Ellis asked. Twice he was told. I thought he only went down once, he said. What round did the fight end? You see, gentlemen, Angelo Dundee interrupted. That's why I wouldn't let him go out for the fifth round. (laughs) Uh, This is the press conference. Jesus, I mean, if you haven't heard that wish list thing, maybe have a little listen to that. Because when you speak quite, you know, about fighters not being interviewed straight from, literally from the fight. I mean, this is in a press conference. Skeezer doesn't even know. What round it ended? Incredible. What a story. But the punch that Frazier actually threw as well, that did all the damage, was a thing of beauty. And Joe knew it as well as soon as it landed. He actually said it felt like when you hit a baseball and you send it sailing into the open field. I mean, it must it was a beauty of a shot as well. Although Frazier was now considered as the official world heavyweight champion, there was the imminent return of a former world champion, and that, of course, was Muhammad Ali. And he brought his status, obviously, into disrepute. And the trash talking actually began while Ali was still in exile. He, he commonly said, he called him, a, I think it was an ugly gorilla, which is something he, he kept saying. And he also called him a pretender, not a real champion. Muhammad Ali told the press any time he could that basically he was the champion. He was a legitimate guy. So every time Frazier gained a little more respect and a little bit more recognition, there was always something was someone downplaying his wonderful achievements. And Frazier didn't seem too bothered at first. He loved to sing, as we mentioned, when he used to go to the church. So just as much as he did fighting. And and he, he, he actually decided that when he does hang him up, he's going to become a singer. In fact, Capitol Records actually signed him to a five-year contract to record songs, many of which he wrote himself. Now, oblivious to many, Ali and Frazier were actually friends. They weren't good friends. They were acquaintances. And Ali was actually called Frazier from time to time during his exile. I believe Frazier even gave him some money as well at times when he was in desperate measures. And he would always have the same message. And, and Ali used to say to him, you just keep whooping those guys in the ring and I'll keep fighting Uncle Sam. And one day we'll make a lot of money together. Frazier did support Ali's right to not serve in the army publicly. And he actually said, if Baptists weren't allowed to fight, I wouldn't fight either. So we do go into a lot more information in some in, in our, one of our legendary nights pod, the, the Freedom Manila. 
there's there's so much more information between these two guys. We could literally just do an episode on Ali Fraser. I'm not seriously. The amount of information out there is insane. Some just nice little stories there about these two just before they do share a ring together. I want to make one prediction. I'm not calling around. I predict that when I meet Joe Frazier, this will be like a good amateur fighting a real professional. This yeah. will be like a kid out of the Olympics meeting the fastest heavyweight champion that ever lived. This will be no contest. This fight will be much easier. He will be easier to hit. He will not be as much trouble or as awkward as Oscar Bonavino. Joe Frazier... This will go down. I predict that the fans will be angry. They'll be mad at the uh, 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 critics. They'll be mad at the experts for misleading them so much. You this man time. will be completely you got, out of you, you got time. Outplayed. You got time. This will you, be no look, contest. Look, That's look, all I want to say. All right. What do you no, say, no, Joe? No, what do you no, say no, to no, that? No, I'd say nothing no, but a bunch of noise. That's all. He's going way back in the time right. of, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? This is the I'm day, man. You understand? I just want you not fighting glory. You not fighting Oscar Bonavena, you're not fighting Sonny Liston, you fighting Joe Frazier. Well, everybody know that. That's, that's not the point. That's the point. Yo, what's what? your prediction? My prediction, the fight wouldn't go to distance. Oh, won't I'll go to stop distance. it. Stop me. You. How soon? What round? Look, don't, anyway, don't, don't let him obligate one you. One to ten, you will be out there. there. I will not let you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You will be out there. He got we famous all about us boxers around him. Get ready, because here I come. All right, that's all I want to say. No no free fight talk, no free fight. There's no amateur there right now. No, this is no, no. a professional fight. I don't want to say the amateur you can forget. Right. Right. One more thing. With the commissioner here and the whole world of authority, I beat Sonny Liston twice, and they wasn't convinced. We don't have that. They know. That's all over. Let me finish. Now you ain't fighting Sonny Liston. No, you talk about to me. No, you, 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 you listen. listen. You listen now. Let me finish something. Look, listen to you. Look, I'm the champ. You, you ain't. You listen. listen. You the champ. Right on. Now listen. That's all over. Sonny Liston is all over. Now you ain't the champ. Hey, listen for me. Why? Now shut up. How, how you gonna do this? Yeah. How you gonna do this? Champ, you go fight more than 4,000 people live. What is this? Now, Ali kept himself as fit as possible while he was suspended from boxing, and he ran frequently into Philadelphia's Fairmont Park. One day, he almost ran right into Fraser, who was out doing his road work. Now, according to Fraser, Ali put his hands up and started jiving. He likes to do that with guys he might fight. He likes to measure them up, see if he can hit them. You really think you can whoop me, Ali probed? I'll whoop mama. She tried to take my title, Fraser said. I think you mean that, Fraser. You dug on right, I do. Well, let's get it on right here, Ali said, putting up his hands and flicking his left. I walked away from him, Fraser remembers. He wasn't going to do that to me, not until they put up the money, I told him. I ain't fighting you now, Clay. I don't even want to waste it in private. I want the whole world to see what I'm going to do to you and in the ring, not here. Fraser refused to call Ali by his new name, which fueled their rivalry a little bit later on. Now, while Fraser was preparing for his first defence, he allowed Ali to get in his head with his persistent trash talk, losing his cool and issuing a challenge. We refer to Come Out Smoking Joe Fraser once again, written by Phil Pep, And this is what he wrote. Joe sent out a public message to Ali. Show up at the pal gym and we'll have it out. We'll see who the real champ is. Muhammad Ali showed up, and so did a thousand fans anticipating the fireworks, hoping to see for free what would cost a week's wages in an arena. The police also showed up, and they suggested that the two fighters take their bout outdoors in Fairmont Park, where there would be no fire hazard. Ali put on his coat, accompanied by his usual entourage, marched defiantly to Fairmont Park. Now there were about 2,000 people in the park, the crowd <laughs> swelling as the news of a rumble spread through the streets of Philadelphia. He wants to show he can whoop me, Mohammed shouted. He says he's the champ. Let him prove it here in the ghetto where the coloured folks can see it. And Mohammed was waiting in the park, waiting to rumble, along with 2,000 people. But they were waiting in vain. Joe Frazier never came, and Ali was enraged. Here I am, he bellowed. I haven't had a fight in three years. I'm 25 pounds overweight and Joe Frazier won't show up. What kind of a champ can he be? A smart one, replied Yank Durham. Joe wasn't going to have a street bite in Matt Fairmont Park and Clay wasn't going to either. They'll fight when the time and the money are right. Wonderful story. Love that. Ali just doing what he's clowning around and he's in exile. I mean, he's not even... At this moment, obviously, there's, there's great talk that he's going to be coming back and... It looks like he's coming back, but he's he's getting in Joe's head now, and Joe clearly 
<laughs> I think he got. I think he would have loved to have gone out there and probably had a fight with with Mohammed Ali. And I'm sure Yank pulled him back and said, "No, no, no, no." When you just wait for the money. I mean, what a great story. And on, on June 15, 1970, a historic ruling by the Supreme Court paved the way for Muhammad Ali's return to boxing. His first fight came against Jerry Quarry in Atlanta, and it was a third round victory. Joe Frazier finally made his first defence against arguably one of the best light heavyweight fighters in the history of the sport, Bob Foster, 41 and 4. Frazier was basically in no mood to slip up, especially with an Ali fight now ready to be made. He once again proved his worth as a legitimate world champion, even if some didn't think so. He stopped Foster in just two rounds on November 18, 1970 at the Cobo Arena in Detroit, a month after Ali's return. So the following month, Ali stopped Oscar Benavina in the final 15th round to remain undefeated and set up a clash of all clashes, it was finally announced 23 days after Ali stopped Bonavina in Toot Shaw's restaurant in Midtown, New York. Muhammad Ali, 31-0, and Joe Frazier would meet on March 8th, 1971 at Madison Square Garden in what Jerry Perenchio was calling the greatest spectacle of all time. Now, Jerry Perenchio outbid many promoters to get the fight of the century. Yank Durham held out for the biggest bids and the price from Jerry was right. Once the money was certified by a bank, Durham agreed that the Parencio Group was the one to get the promotion. He made his recommendations to Ali's people, they approved, and the fight was made thanks to Yank Durham. Yank said, money talks. If somebody came with an offer, I'd tell them to let me see the money. When this man, as in Parencio, came up with the money, he got the fight. Now with the deal complete, the trash talk really began to heat up. Joe retaliated to Ali's taunts of him being ugly and not the real champ, saying, I call him Clay because he said he doesn't care what I call him. That's his name his mama and daddy gave him, so that's what I'll call him. Ali began to get political, calling Fraser the white man's hope and an Uncle Tom, a pawn of the white establishment. Even Bryant Gumbel, a sports writer, wrote a cynical piece asking, is Joe Fraser a white champion? with black skin. Fraser's response was an angry one. He thought that would weaken me when it came time to face with him in the ring. Well, he was wrong. It didn't weaken me. It awakened me to what a cheap shot son of a bitch he was. Jim Lampley of HBO Boxing recalls how he and others perceived the two champions going into the fight. And in Jim Lampley's words, he said, we saw it as a battle between the shiny knight, Muhammad Ali, who was a political martyr, who was the real champion, who was the one deserving of all the public attention and the accolades, and this substitute. Ali's campaign created a divide racially and politically. If you were black and against the war, you sided with Ali. But if you were white and pro-war, you sided with Fraser. Now, because of this, Fraser's children were bullied at school and his family were even given police protection after receiving death threats. Crazy. Absolutely insane that um, it, it come to this. And, and the fact that it, oh my goodness me, did Muhammad Ali have the gift of the gab? Because how on earth could anyone even call <laughs> Joe Frazier a white man's hope and an Uncle Tom? It was like, really? I mean, we've just gone through what he's been through in his life, and he certainly wasn't that. If people thought that of him, I'm glad, I'm, I'm hoping if, if anyone listening did, then, you know, you've changed your mind already because that was so wrong. Each man was actually guaranteed $2.5 million and the largest single payday for an entertainer at Amphilete at the time as well. It was a spectacle with all the stars, gangsters and politicians, you name it, they were all there. The fight wasn't bad either. Ali took an early lead, but Frazier looked dangerous throughout with his dangerous left hook. He landed several and forced the pace. Then Frazier landed his trademark left in the 15th and final round to put Ali down for the first time in his career. An absolute peach it was as well. And it was a special round. It will go down as one of the best rounds in, in, in boxing history. The whole fight in itself, just it was an excellent, just a spectacular, colourful event. And Ali declared that if Frazier won, he would crawl across the ring and admit that Frazier was the greatest. So after the fight, obviously, Frazier won by unanimous decision in the end. And he, he asked for Ali to fulfil his promise to come crawling across that ring, but he didn't, obviously. Ali was actually very bitter and he called it a white man's decision and insisted that he won and Frazier... Basically, he was just pleased that it would. he was finally able to be a worthy world champion. And in the press conference after the fight, 
He couldn't resist, but asked, he said, what can you say about me now? What can you say now? He underestimated me. He thought I was slow and flat footed. He can punch me, but he can't hurt me. And this is the pinnacle of Joe Frazier's career. But hopefully this comes up as a legendary night show because I'd love to really go into great detail about the fight of the century. Does it make you think any less of Muhammad Ali hearing these stories from the Joe Frazier perspective, hearing how he was so dogged in his approach to try and, first of all, get the fight, but to try and embarrass him and to try and use this this racial divide to try and get the black people on his side and, and, and basically say that Joe Frazier was just a white man in a black man's body and, and all the type of stuff that he that he did. Now, obviously, we, we know Muhammad Ali, all the, the good stuff that he done. But this is a moment where you start to think about Muhammad Ali and you think, did he really need to do this? Did he really need to, to, to say these types of things? Was it all just a ploy to get into his head? Because if it was, it didn't work. Because Joe Fraser won that fight and he got him in that 15th round, as you rightly pointed out. But in your opinion, knowing what you know about Muhammad Ali and the career profile we've done of him, and obviously we've done the Thriller and Manila Legendary Night, this fight of the century, the build-up to it, the way things went, does it make you feel a little bit less about Muhammad Ali than what you once did. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a tricky one because they were friends and what, what Ali said, it was just a publicity thing and it was just to promote a fight, etc. And But when you, when you know, when it gets to the point where if he's ringing him up one-to-one and then obviously, you, you know, you're hearing things about the phrases being bullied at school and being death threats coming through the door, you know, it, it does just, it's, surely, he, you know, if you're meant to be a pal, even if you're an acquaintance, you sort of tone it down a little bit because obviously what he says people are going to jump on. He was a powerful figure at the time. So, yeah, I think he was a shitty thing to do. And and, and there was so much more information as well. We, I mean, that's why I'd love to do the fight of the century at one point, Sean, when we do legendary nights. Because all the build-up to it and everything else, there's so much more to it. And, um, and yeah, he was, he was an arsehole, um, Harry Harley. And um, he... he <laughs> Joe did. He took it. I mean, after the fight as well, he sort of sits in the mirror and he's sort of just. Oh, he's talking to himself. This was someone sports writer sort of sitting in the dressing room, and they they said oh, like Frazier was sitting in the dressing room just looking at himself and talking to himself. He was just so happy. He was at the pinnacle of his life and he was he was bashed up badly from that fight. But um, you know, it was just great credit to him. And and what a guy. I mean. I don't know. It, from, from coming from where we just started from to now being the heavyweight champion of the world in the fight of the century, which was labelled as the third time that was ever labelled as the fight of the century, um, was just brilliant. And, and Harley, yeah, it does make me just this. I just detested him at the time, but I, I can see why he's pissed off. He was exiled, and I, I just think maybe he was. I, I really can't believe it. I just didn't like it. I mean, what about you, Sean? What do you think of it, and and what that did for the Fraser family? I think what it did for the Fraser family is more what kind of... I know this has all been and gone, but when you go through the story and you, you start to, to realise how nice of a guy he was, how much of a family man he was, and all he ever wanted to do was, was provide for his family, it makes you feel a little bit annoyed at the, the way Muhammad Ali acted. Obviously, you know we're talking in, in retrospect here in hindsight, of course, but when we covered the career of Muhammad Ali and all the great stuff he did in his life... It's little moments like this where it can kind of turn your opinion just a tad on Muhammad Ali. And, and it makes you grow a stronger affiliation for Joe Frazier and an appreciation for him, for what he had to go through. And obviously, as you've pointed out, a legendary night will at some point come up to do a full detailed build-up breakdown and aftermath on this particular fight. And that that's where you'll be able to get more of an insight of how bad things really were. We've skimmed the edges of, of that for this episode because this is all about Joe and more about Joe's life and career. But once we do something like that, you know, for you guys listening, you'll get more of an insight into that. But we just wanted to, to put into context how big of a fight this was for Joe Massive. Frazier's career. This this was the pinnacle, really, of Joe Frazier's career. That fight, it was a punishing fight for both of these men. Ali actually had a suspected broken jaw and Frazier needed a 10-month layoff during that time Fraser actually lived a celebrity lifestyle mingling with the stars and visiting the White House even he moved Florence and the now five kids to a bigger house in the suburbs of Philly that he'd bought for just under a million dollars so that fight the money that was earned from it had done so much for his family so although they felt a lot of shit in the build-up to the Ali fight after the Ali fight the money that that brought obviously gave them a, a much much better life 
and he returned to the ring on January the 15th, 1972, and he knocked out Terry Daniels in four comfortable rounds. He then mullered Ron Stander into retirement at the Civic Auditorium in Nebraska in May before signing to fight the dangerous and undefeated George Foreman, who's now 37-0, in a fight build as the Sunshine Showdown because it took place at the National Stadium in Kingston, Jamaica. Now, interestingly, it was Foreman that admitted in later life that he was actually afraid of Fraser. He didn't fight scared, that's for sure, because it was a torrid fight for Joe Fraser, who was knocked down three times in the first round and three times in the second before the fight was stopped. Joe said, after the fourth knockdown, I realised that I'm getting my butt whooped. And he sure did. And the bout was actually voted the 1973 Ring Magazine Fight of the Year. It was Joe's first defeat of his career, taking his record to 29-1. and Now, Joe actually didn't then return to the ring until the summer of 1973 against Joe Bugner, who was 43-5-1 at the Earl's Court Exhibition Centre here in the UK in London. And it was the one and only time Joe fought on these shows. And it was a bloody and brutal affair. An absolute slugfest that Fraser actually won, narrowly. Bugner had gone the distance with Ali and Fraser in the space of six months, but yet was still not given any respect from the English fans. He was in a bad way after fighting Fraser. For two months, his kidney and liver were bruised and he was pissing blood for two weeks. <laughs> oh my God. Absolutely punishing there. You know, that was credit to, to Joe to manage to come back and, and to go come over here and fight Joe Bugner. And, you know, that, that Foreman fight as well. I mean, in the documentary, they, they, it, Mavis Fraser was the first fight he, he went to to watch his dad. And he took him over to Jamaica. And, and obviously, and Foreman's saying he was scared of him. He actually says, I was scared of Joe. I really was. And he literally, before he came out, he said, I was petrified of him. And then obviously, he mauls. Joe Frazier and, and Mavis Frazier was sort of saying because he was only a kid and he said when his dad went down for the first time he was going ah oh, yeah my dad's just playing and the second time oh, yeah my dad's just messing around and the third time full time he was like oh shit my dad's in trouble <laughs> and he, that was when he realised like yeah my dad's getting his ass handed to him here and <laughs> it was an absolute pounding two weeks pissing blood as well for poor old Joe Bugner and still he gets no credibility for that it's crazy but the one thing you know that did happen young Darren obviously he Helped Joe from that defeat to come back and get the win against Bugner. But then, unfortunately, tragedy struck that summer. Uh, literally the next month, I believe. And young Darum actually suffered a stroke and eventually died in Philadelphia two days later on August 28th, 1973 at the Temple University Hospital. He was only 52 years of age and Frazier was left devastated. And he said, years later, I miss him. But. We have no control when the big man comes calling. Me and you got to do the same thing one of these days. And he lost Yank, which was a huge blow for him. And it was just before the Muhammad Ali rematch as well. So, a oh, bitterly disappointing for Joe. And when he does talk about it, and you do see it in the documentary, I mean, when he just says, I miss him, he's cut up badly, at, you know, years and years on. I think when you look at what Yank Durham did for his career, the smart choices he made in terms of the money, the the tournament, and, and not putting him in the tournament because he knew that him and Buster Mathis would eventually fight, and it paid off for him. Things like that paid off. The Muhammad Ali situation, it paid off. It got Joe Frazier the life that he had. It got him the money that he had at that time. So to lose someone who was so influential in his career, not just as a manager, but as a trainer, the one that taught him to slip, bob and weave and throw that left hook, huge huge loss to to his life and into his career so after that frazier yeah. took some time out until actually returning to face muhammad ali once again who was now 43 and 2 for the rematch on january the 28th 1974 at msg in a non-title fight during a televised joint interview prior to their rematch ali continued again from the first fight to insult fraser who became fed up with his mouth and was still probably hurting from the death of Yank Durham. So it resulted in the two of them brawling on the studio floor. Now, we did discuss this in our, in our Best <laughs> Boxing Brawls episode. Please go and check it out because we did more of a, an in-depth on, on this particular brawl. Eddie Futch, who had come in as a number two to Yank, then decides to take over the full duties with agreement from Joe Frazier for the fight and would continue to do so for the rest of Joe Frazier's career. It was a good fight. That actually went under the radar due to the magnitude of the other two. But 
it's well worth watching the second Ali Fraser fight. Now yeah. Ali Ali was clever on the inside and he he held a lot more than uh, first encounter to to basically nullify that left hook. He smothered Joe Fraser's work, which infuriated Eddie Futch. He complained that the referee favoured Ali and allowed for excessive holding. Fraser was lucky not to have been stopped in the second round when he found himself in all sorts of trouble, but the referee came to his rescue by breaking them up, mistakenly thinking that the round had ended. This gave Fraser <laughs> enough time to, to recover. Ali was given a unanimous decision and Fraser fell to his second defeat in his last three fights. <laughs> yeah, really funny for the referee. Again, I mean, these fights are on there, but this one does get missed, obviously, for for obvious reasons. But if you, if you just watch it as a one-off, maybe just stick it on and just watch the second fight without thinking about the first and obviously the initial third, uh, the rubber match, and just think about it as just two guys and you would enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a really good fight. It's just, it's just the other two are just magnificent. A second defeat, you know, three, two losses. And he's starting to feel it a little bit now as well, Joe. His eye is starting to play up and he's starting to feel it. He's, these sort of arthritis is creeping in there. And, you know, six months later, Joe did carry on. He stopped Jerry Quarry. He was 49, six and four in a repeat of their first fight before giving Jimmy Ellis, who was 39 11 and 1 just surprising that Jimmy Ellis wasn't, wasn't a bad fighter but you know his career took a huge dip after the Frazier defeat and another pasting it was in May of 1975 the referee on the night was actually the former light heavyweight champion and a former opponent of Joe Frazier which was Bob Foster and after a cut opened on Ellis's eye Dundee told Bob to stop it in the ninth of a scheduled 12. Now, Muhammad Ali was next on October 1st, 1975. We're not going to go into great details. Look, you can check this out. It's on a Legendary Nights episode. For all the detail on Ali and Frazier and their rubber match, that Freedom of Manila, it is a spectacle. As, as we mentioned with the first one, Fire the Century and, and the Freedom of Manila, both great Legendary Nights. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to say too much. The details there, Gan, have a listen back to the episode. It's another great, great episode, isn't it, Sean? It's one that you should go and check out. Uh, the reason we don't want to do it for this episode is obviously we're, we're kind of repeating what we've already done yeah. for you guys. So please listen to the tale of Ali Fraser Free, the thriller in Manila. Go and listen to the Legendary Nights feed. It's in season one. We've got all the build up, the breakdown, and the aftermath in this. So instead, what we've decided to do for the career profile of Joe Fraser is leave you with a beautifully crafted piece of writing that described the extraordinary spectacle of the thriller in Manila by The Guardian's greatest sports observer. Hugh McAvenny. He wrote, What we saw in Quenzon City, the capital of the Philippines, in midweek represented a shining flood of that purity. To say so is not to claim that the third and last meeting of Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali would leave all who witnessed it ready to embrace the values of the prize ring. Those 40 odd minutes of unremitting violence must have had the opposite effect on many. They would recoil from the thought that two men who were formidable in so many ways should seek to express themselves through an exchange of suffering and especially they would wince at the sight of Fraser, his marvellous body reduced to a dilapidated lurching vehicle for his unyielding will reeling blindly in the murderous crossfire of the world champion's final assaults. Extraordinarily, Joe was suffering with high blood pressure and as you said, Johnson, arthritis, while a cataract actually rendered his left eye all but blind. Joe knew he wasn't in good nick, but he said, I knew I was going blind, but I had a dream to become a world champion. I was too far gone to change my mind. Beautiful writing, Hugh McElvedi. I mean, that that is on the uh, the Guardian's, uh, you, you can find that whole article. It, that is literally how he starts it. And every time I read it, it's just... It almost gives me, it does give me ghost bumps because it's just the way he puts things together and the, the wording of, he just creates his picture. I thought it's a, it's a, it's a marvellous piece of writing from him and, and you know, it, it's, it gives you a, a, a very vague picture of what that fight was all about. Uh, if you haven't seen it, goodness me, where have you been? It should be your go-to fight, really. And the fact that Joe fought on arthritis, cataract, it rendered his left eye to literally blindness, high blood pressure. I mean, the, the muscle pains, he was getting injections by his doctor. His doctor actually went to the Manila, went to Manila to, for, for literally just to keep giving him injections to just get him to, into the ring. I think if Yank was around, I think he may well have been telling Joe not to have 
gone in that ring. Saying that, I think Joe was adamant he would have gone in in a way. I think this was really the point. I mean, what a great... I mean, you, the fight of the century was marvellous. And then you get this. He, he fights on, Joe. And he fights on against George Foreman. 41-1 and one now, obviously. His single defeat was against Muhammad Ali. The rematch happened on June 15, 1976. But it was the same result. Frazier actually fought with contact lenses as well. And Foreman knocked them out and Joe out in the fifth round. And Joe actually retired from the ring. And he hit the road as an entertainer, duetting with some legends in show business. And basically, he, he, he had a good time. <laughs> That's about it, really. He does come back and, he's, and his family get involved. Well... He retires after George Foreman, temporarily retires. And then, like you say, he goes on the road. He starts enjoying what he wanted to enjoy years before. And then, for one reason or another, he, he, he decides to, to, you know, to get back in the ring. So, in between all this happening, his, his children, Hector and Jackie, two of his children, actually fought professionally. But it was Marvis Fraser that got the furthest. And he actually followed in... Joe's footsteps. Uh, he didn't quite pick up another world title. He actually lost to Larry Holmes, but he did make a return on December the 3rd, 1981 and fought to a draw against Floyd Cummings. Joe Fraser had that one more fight against Floyd Cummings and he finally ended his boxing career after that draw with 32 wins, 27 by way of knockout, 4 losses and only 1 draw. And it brought the end to a career of one of the great heavyweight champions. I mean, you said at the start of the episode you put him in your top 10 and you know, people might argue that he shouldn't be in the top 10 because he, he, he won the world heavyweight title uh, and then he defended it against Muhammad Ali in the fight of the century and then after that, really, what else did he do? People do say that about Joe Fraser, but I think it's the cultural impact that Joe Fraser had with them fights with Muhammad Ali that, that puts him into anybody's top 10, really, as to why... He is one of the great heavyweight champions. He he may not have that longevity as a heavyweight champion, but again, it's the it's the cultural impact that he had and the fact that in that era of golden fighters and that era of some of the greatest heavyweight fighters, well, obviously Ali being quipped as the the greatest heavyweight fighter of all time, and he was able to go out there beat the greatest. He was able to go out there mix it with the best. And for me, he had a, a wonderful career. It was just a shame that, obviously, at the end of it, you know, he ends up with all these ailments and, and practically blind in his eye as well. I think that's that's the thing, isn't it? Is that is that's that's the reason behind why he had to quit. And um, I, I believe it was uh, Larry Merchant that said that you know the way Joe Frazier fought, it's inevitable that it was only going to be a short career, and it, it's it's pretty true because you know he was in slipping shots and dodging and bobbing and weaving as Yank had masterfully put together and in whipping in them left hooks where he'd, he'd let that Dugent showed him to just throw three or four of them you know eventually one of them's going to just kill you that left hook was devastating and because he was so small you know he had it was all wrong really for a heavyweight fighter but yet he was able to beat the best of them um it was a bit like an Ezard Charles as well if you like like as well we done Ezard Charles his career profile and now, they didn't quite get that publicity either at the time when they were great. It's only now, later on, that we're able to look back and us as boxing enthusiasts, you know, we look at their careers and we're like, wow, how have these two never really been mentioned? Why didn't they, didn't they not get that limelight? But it's because they were just family men, quite happy to just prod along, get their money, and just they just enjoyed to fight and get enough money to get through the shit that they, you know, they were in early doors. So... Absolutely makes my top 10, always. I, I'd literally be in and around the sort of top six to any, I'd say probably top seven, to be fair, Joe Frazier for me, uh, just because of his style. He was all wrong, but yet you stick him in any generation, Coy, he murders a load of bodies there, I'm telling you. Now, he was actually inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990. And... As we said, we, we regard him as a true legend of the sport, but it was the relationship with Muhammad Ali that, that still left a lasting effect. He, he did, unfortunately, retain that bitterness towards Ali many years after and suggested that Ali's battle with Parkinson's syndrome was a form of divine retribution for his earlier behaviour, which, again, it shows how... how how hurt he was by everything that went on. Now, in 2001, Ali actually apologised to Fraser via a New York Times article saying, in a way, Joe's right. I said a lot of things in the heat of the moment that I shouldn't have said. 
I called him names I shouldn't have called him. I apologise for that. I'm sorry. It was all meant to promote the fight. Now, Fraser reportedly embraced it, though he later retorted that Ali only apologised to a newspaper and not to him, and he said, I'm still waiting for him to say it to me. And to this, Ali responded, If you see Fraser, you tell him he's still a gorilla. Ali also said in an interview, I wasn't going to get on my knees and crawl and beg to forgive him. Fraser told Sports Illustrated in May of 2009 that he no longer had hard feelings for Ali. And there's something that I just wanted to mention here. There's a, there is actually a documentary about fighters that fought Ali. And I don't know if you've seen it, Johnston. There's a few of them. The guys like Javalo are in there. Obviously, you've got guys with like Fraser. And there's one there's one particular Foreman. interview of Foreman, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's one particular interview with Joe Fraser. And I think you can see he starts to break up a little bit in that interview. You can see him getting emotional uh, about the interview and about Ali. And it's, it's like there's a lot of regret over what happened. There's a, there's a lot of feelings that's still there even at that point in time when the interviews were done. Again, Ali was right to apologise for what he did. He should have said it to him. And it's just he's just yeah. never understood why why these two were never brought together while they were while they were on the planet. Why they was just never brought together to have that one moment, that one divine moment between one another and and just sort of bury the hatchet once and for all. It was good that obviously he did end up getting rid of that ill feeling towards Ali, but that just that whole relationship between one another, uh, it's just, it's really, really sad. And, and to be honest with you, the, the one comparison I can make to it in terms of uh, high profile relationships that, that started well and went sour is, is going into the rap world and looking at Tupac Shakur and, and, and Biggie Smalls, <laughs> them two started off with a great relationship with each other and then ended up literally hating each other to the point where people thought that, Biggie was the one that was responsible for the death of Tupac Shakur. It's, it's crazy. But I compare it to that type of relationship where these two are guys that are, shared so many rounds together, literally spilt blood and guts on the ring together, and, and still there was all this ill feeling you know, near the end before Joe Frazier eventually let it go. Yeah, yeah, it was just. I think that's a great analogy there. I think you you bang on with that. Um, just it's 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 sad to see just two different opinions on how to publicise a fight. Whereas, I think for me as well, from what what I picked up from Joe is when he before although the fight of the century was when it all began, he sort of just sort of brushed it off because I think he won the fight as well. It made him feel good, but it was the Freeman in that really pissed him off because the fight was sold. You know that fight was always gonna sell. So there was no need for him to just do the things that he and say the things that he said. So I think that's really it really hurt Joe uh, even more so. But in uh, one thing that happened, as we mentioned in 1973, Joe Frazier did actually purchase a property from in the Philly suburbs, that 140 acres in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He bought it for exactly eight hundred and forty three thousand dollars. That was the back end of that money from that fight of the century. Now, five years later, a, de- a developer, so this was like 78, actually bought the property for $1.8 million. Now, Fraser, being smart, obviously learning from Yank Down, actually, he, he decided to take annual payments from a trust that bought the land uh, with the money that he earned in the ring. And then, and then the trust, unfortunately, went bankrupt and the payments seized. And then there was this issue with Fraser who tried to sue the business partners, insisting that their signature had been forged on documents and blah, blah, blah. And basically, it it all ended wrong. He didn't get no money from it. No, there was no proof. And then that land was subdivided and turned into residential community. And the land today is actually worth a hundred million dollars. Devastating for Joe Frazier when I heard that and tried to be smart, sell, sells the property sort of eight years on. If it had held out, it probably could have got a bit more. The company goes bust and he loses that money. Hence the reason why he, he was poor. He was actually poor. He was living in that Philly gym, literally on his own. Uh, around the back of the gym called the Joe Fraser's gym right underneath a railway bridge and he was bitter and it, it just it just wasn't good although it seems like he forgive, forgave him there were some interviews who I'm not quite sure if he did yeah really sad ending considering the amount of money he earned now with the help of uh, Peter Pichard Joe Fraser towards the end of his life formed the Smoking Joe Fraser Foundation the purpose of the foundation was to give back to trouble and in need youth now, Peter Bichard volunteered to run the foundation for Fraser, but once Fraser's health declined, the foundation was shelved and he was diagnosed with diabetes and higher blood pressure, 
Fraser lost millions of, of dollars due to the mismanagement of, of real estate holdings as a partial explanation for, you know, his economic woes, as we, as we talked about the land earlier. Now, he ended up being diagnosed with liver cancer in late September of 2011. And by November 2011, he was under hospice care where he died on the 7th of November at the age of 67. Upon hearing of Fraser's death, Muhammad Ali said, The world has lost a great champion. I will always remember Joe with respect and admiration. Fraser's private funeral took place on the 14th of November at the end on Tabernacle Baptist Church in Philadelphia. And in addition to friends and family, it was attended by Muhammad Ali, John King, of all people, Larry Holmes, Magic Johnson, Dennis Rodman, among others. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, who spoke during the service, asked those in attendance to stand and show your love. And reportedly, Ali stood with the audience and clapped vigorously. Nice way to end it. I mean, it's not nice. In fact, that obviously we lost Joe Frazier. Uh, but the fact that Ali did go and it was a sort of friends and family and, and, it, and you, you hear that he did sort of stand and applaud Joe and said some lovely words. I honestly don't believe that Marion Ali had any real problems with Joe. Um, I just think that he pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> That's what he did. He just, he had that knack and, and some people took it better than others. Unfortunately, Joe, because of the impact it had on his close family, he loved, he adored his family. And he also, the one thing he always said is he didn't want his kids to ever go into fighting. Never wanted them to become fighters and three of them end up going into boxing. He said he wanted them to be lawyers or he wanted, you know, he gave them a great start. He, every buck, every dollar he earned, literally he wanted to earn for his family enough for him to have himself a nice car and live a nice life but nothing too extravagant i mean he would always get the car from his, the love he had for the cars with his dad but even the, even his sparring partners you know when you read stuff about we there's so much information we could have put in this but his sparring partners used to say he was their friend he, you know you go with some fighters and it was just where the sparring partners we don't even eat together you literally fight them in the ring and then they just piss off and then that's it or they use you as a skivvy Joe Frazier used to see him as a mate. They'd have meals together. They would spar together. And they, they, they would be friends with him. He was just a warm person. Just He turned bitter from the from what Ali sort of delivered to him in the fights. And I think he just, you know, I don't know, he just stayed with him. Unfortunately, sometimes these things just stick with people and they can't get through it. A, a legend of the sport for me. A right, absolute, true legend of, of boxing. Now, the International Boxing Research Organization rates Fraser among the 10 greatest heavyweights of all time. So they put him into that top 10, as, as you do, and, and as I yeah. do, to be fair. Now, the Ring magazine named him Fighter of the Year in 1967, 1970, and 1971. While the Boxing Writers Association of America named him Fighter of the Year in 69, 71, and 75. In 1999, the Ring magazine ranked him the 8th greatest heavyweight and box rec still ranks him as the 18th greatest heavyweight of all time and as we said earlier he is inducted into the international boxing hall of fame and he's also inducted into the world boxing hall of fame so as we were saying earlier when we talked about the impact and the cultural impact he had on the heavyweight division whilst he might not have been a three or a four time world champion even what he did in his career, winning the world title, beating and defending it against Muhammad Ali, and the impact that them three fights had on the world, it just goes to show you like that, that, that Joe Frazier is one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. He is, and we, we both wholeheartedly agree with it. And I think what he also did outside of the ring, the way he was as a man, the way he was with his with his family, and the love that he had for his family is just so great to hear about. And the love that everybody in Philadelphia had for him. You know, there is a, a, a statue in Philadelphia, in the south of Philadelphia, of him there. Just like there was a, a rocky one at the top of the steps in Philadelphia. There is actually a Joe Fraser statue in South Philadelphia. And it's great that they do honour him in, in such a great, great way that he's, he's always going to be remembered as this great heavyweight champion. And, and I'm finally glad that we've been able to do this for this episode of Career Profiles. We've obviously covered people like Mike Tyson and Muhammad Ali, but... Joe Frazier is one of them that's always going to be named as one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. So it was great that we've got the opportunity to do this one. Yeah, and that's great about the statue. I didn't know that. And and it just it's funny, isn't it? Because we, we, obviously the story in there with one of his trainers saying that he used to 
punch uh, the meat in the butchers or jab the meat and then run up those museum steps. It's quite funny. I, I, you do wonder if Rocky nicked that from from Joe and it being in Philly as well. A, a great. I mean, look, it was brilliant to do Joe and I just hope that we've done him justice. I'm sure we do our best. We do do a decent job, I think, Sean. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, our love for boxing and these fighters always comes through. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Of course, we hope you've enjoyed listening to it. Please let us know your thoughts by letting us know on Twitter at career underscore profiles or the Facebook page, BTR Boxing Podcast Network. If you've got Instagram, you can find us on there, BTR Boxing Podcast on Instagram as well. And I want to give a big shout out to all the patrons who support us as you will be having early access to this episode, of course. Give a big shout out to Tyler Dyer, Rob Evans, Ben Waters, Nick Canada, Brendan O'Flaherty, and the newest patron, Mike Scaman. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting us as always. We hope you've enjoyed your early access to this particular episode. And for anybody else, if you want to go and check out what Patreon is all about, the membership-based service to the podcast network, you can do so by checking us out at patreon.com forward slash BTR Boxing Podcast Network. Go and see the available membership tiers get access to episodes earlier than general release you can also get involved in polls patron only episodes so there's episodes there that won't be released on the main feed please go and check them all out they are available to you there go and check it out fight fans we really hope you've enjoyed this career profile coming out smoking smoking joe frazier thanks for listening and cry I've had my fill of good and bad now there are much I've not tried and when I think of all I've had now I'm frank to say I've done okay I travel for a long